subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. There is a huge evolutionary benefit to staying awake and alert at all times. We know that animals like dolphins and whales in fact keep a part of their brain active when they're sleeping so that they can keep swimming. And yet, for some reason, we sleep compulsively when we're sleep deprived. Most of us know that going long periods without sleep is unsustainable. It is harmful to our health and behavior. Our cognition declines. We are unable to form memories. And eventually, there are long-term health consequences to chronic sleep deprivation. At one point, we just succumb to sleep. But while we understand the evolutionary benefit for drives, for hunger and sex, we don't fully understand evolutionarily and neurobiologically what drives us to sleep and what the benefits are from that perspective. In this video, we'll talk about sleep, sleep deprivation and all the mysteries surrounding the process of sleeping and waking up. I'm Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. The fact that dolphins and whales sleep with only half their brains itself indicates the importance of sleep, especially in mammals, even though there is the overwhelming need to stay alert. And we know, with a lot of evidence to support it, that sleep is good for us. It's good for our body, it's good for our minds and our general overall health. But if we're up for 24 hours, it really decreases our cognitive ability remarkably and also alters our mood. There is deterioration in the brain and studies have shown that after pulling an all-nighter and driving, it could potentially be much more dangerous than driving after having consumed above permissible limits of alcohol. So clearly, there is some brain function that goes for a toss when we don't sleep. There are different states of sleep areas that are targeted in our brain when we're sleeping, the mechanism of sleeping itself which we don't fully understand and processes that track how we sleep. These are what are being explored in a review paper from researchers at Imperial College London from the Department of Dementia Research. Sleep can be measured since it is so common and universal. In vertebrates, there is REM and non-REM or NREM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement and we're all familiar with REM sleep where when people are sleeping, we can see their eyes darting around rapidly. But when we fall asleep first, we enter into a non-REM cycle. Our eyes are closed and we're in the process of falling asleep, but we can immediately wake up if there is a stimulus. This happens for about 5 to 10 minutes. Then there's light sleep where our body temperature starts to drop and our heart rate slows down. This goes on for about 10 to 25 minutes as we get ready to enter into deep sleep. In the deep sleep stage, it is harder to be woken up. If we're woken up while we are in the deep sleep stage, we're usually quite disoriented for a few minutes and many of us even have a headache. All of this is non-REM sleep. And the older we get, the less deep sleep we get and the more light sleep we have, even though we need just as much deep sleep as younger people for effective functioning. REM sleep, on the other hand, happens around 90 minutes after we fall asleep. This is when our eyes are moving rapidly, but because our eyes are closed, there is no visual input that is going to the brain. We dream during REM sleep as our brain is active and this comes in cycles. REM sleep is what is needed for our brain to form connections necessary for learning and it is also when our bodies produce certain beneficial proteins. Our heart rate and breathing goes up too during REM sleep. We typically spend about 20% of our sleep in the REM phase and being in this phase is necessary for long-term memory formation. This phase comes in cycles of varying durations when we are asleep. This is what we understand about how humans sleep. We don't fully understand the mechanisms that other animals have, even though we are able to extrapolate our own findings to mammals and vertebrates. But what happens when we're sleep deprived at a molecular and cellular level? What drives us to eventually succumb to sleep? And which parts of our brain need sleep? Why are we unable to sleep like dolphins do? Neuroscientists have tried to examine this at a cellular level. 
Mutant mice have been created where some sleep promoting centers in their brains have been deactivated and disabled and yet they could not avoid non-REM sleep even though they were able to survive without REM sleep. So why is non-REM sleep useful? The researchers in this paper talk about how it seems sleep provides some basic housekeeping functions which get affected and cause negative effects if we don't sleep. And these processes are metabolic or even structural that help in functioning of the brain. These processes don't occur in the brain when we are awake. It occurs only in a brain that's asleep. Even when we are extremely well rested and not tired at all when we're awake, we still need to sleep at night. So whatever happens in the brain when we're asleep happens only when we are unconscious. So then if we look at mechanisms that help us stay conscious, that once again comes down to structural changes in the brain and our body's chemical composition. These include the flushing out or depletion of certain chemicals or synapses connecting in our brain and making networks and structural changes. There's also temperature that seems to play a role here. During non-REM sleep, the brain's temperature drops by about 2 degrees Celsius as shown in mice. This helps conserve energy. When the temperature drops, certain RNA proteins and genes get expressed and these are the ones that are sensitive to lower temperature and don't really activate when the temperature is higher. They perform structural remodeling in the brain. This is also similar to what gets induced in animals that hibernate and sleep in the winter months for a long period. What then is the role of REM sleep? We don't know. And now we don't think it's necessary for survival, at least in mice. Many mice have been modified to remove REM sleep completely and they do engage in non-REM sleep when the brain is inactive. During REM sleep, the brain is active and the brain temperature rises. Because this happens in a cycle, the researchers hypothesize that maybe restorative functions that occur during non-REM sleep when the brain's temperature drops are then tested out during REM sleep when our eyes are rapidly moving and the temperature goes up. So then what determines these cycles? For that we need to look at what happens when we are sleep deprived. We need to catch up on lost sleep but not just the quantity of sleep, we also need good quality of sleep. If we miss one night's sleep, the next night we sleep a bit deeper. If we nap in the afternoon, it can delay the onset of non-REM sleep and sometimes even make it difficult for us to sleep during the night. In which case, why can our brain not partially sleep? Why can't we function like dolphins then and just rest parts of our brain that require sleep? It looks like humans need the entire brain to rest and be unconscious for these processes to occur. And this could probably be because of the drop in temperature which is required for certain restorative functions to occur. There is also a primal urge driving this. When we are hungry or thirsty, we will do whatever we can to find some way to get food or water. We end up doing the same thing for sleep when we are sleep deprived. We do whatever we can to catch up on sleep. But we can temporarily put it off. Many of us have pulled all-nighters maybe at least once whether for work or when studying or just for fun. Birds have shown the ability to put off sleep too. When birds are flying, especially over long distances and they're migrating, they sleep just for a few minutes a day. But when they are on land, they can sleep for over 12 hours a day and catch up on all their lost sleep. So sleep can effectively be divided into chunks and calculated and spread out. But then what we don't understand is what the biochemical process is that drives the mathematics of tracking how long we sleep and the quality of sleep that we get. We can hypothesize that there is some substance that accumulates during sleep which tracks how long we are awake, like a counter that is getting depleted. It then sends some feedback signals to induce sleep and then gets degraded and replenished when we are asleep.
But then comes the question of what determines when we need to wake up. There is of course the circadian rhythm where nearly all life on earth that is exposed to the sun times its sleep cycles with the sun because of course the sun is our primary source of energy. But what apart from that, what really monitors how well our brain has rested and decides that this is the time that we need to wake up? We don't know. When we are sleep deprived, our drive to sleep is similar to what we experience when we are sedated or under anesthesia before we go into a surgery. The cells and the parts of the brain that those drugs target could potentially provide the restorative effects of good sleep when we're sleep deprived is what the researchers hypothesize. We do feel really terrible after a surgery, but that is because after having had a surgery, the body has suffered some form of trauma. So therapeutic effects of sedatives possibly are not strong enough against that experience. But then again, anesthesia and sedatives and drugs that put us to sleep do not induce the REM and non-REM cycles that we experience when we sleep naturally. The more we understand these complexities around sleep, why we sleep, why our bodies measure sleep, how sleeping naturally differs from sleeping when sedated, and all the circuitry that goes into making us sleep, the more we can understand how well we could potentially develop drugs that selectively target cells or regions of the brain to induce the restorative properties of good quality sleep. But for now, most things about our sleeping habits and the brain's processes around sleep remain a mystery in neuroscience.